I'm Norm Silverstein. Thanks for joining us. I'm in good company today with someone who's a scientist, an activist, and an educator. The Democrat and Chronicle calls Dr. Walter Cooper a superhero because of his contributions to the Rochester community, his devotion to equality, and his commitment to young people. Dr. Cooper is associated with nearly every social equality institution in this community, from the Community Foundation to Action for a Better Community to the Urban League. People who have seen you in the media might not uh, know this, but actually, Dr. Cooper, you're a scientist by trade. And, and uh, I'd like to go back to your early days and, and what made you choose uh, becoming a scientist? Well, that's very interesting, Norm. I, uh, I was born in uh, Clareton, Pennsylvania, a uh, small industrial town 14 miles southeast of Pittsburgh in the Monongahela Valley region. And uh, I went to, I started elementary school in 1934. Uh, my elementary school was only about 200 yards away from a pond. And uh, I was always intrigued and especially in the spring by the tadpoles and the frogs and the other uh, aquatic life that existed in that pond. So. I was inquisitive, very inquisitive. And the other aspect of it, I had known African Americans who were pharmacists, doctors, uh, even a lawyer, and, uh, but I didn't know any scientists and I thought that would be a good challenge for me. But you grew up in a household where, although your father didn't read or write, your mother, I understand, kept a lot of books in the house. Yes, that's true. Uh, my father didn't have a day of education. And, uh, but my mother had nine years of education in southwestern Georgia, and they migrated north in 1921. And my mother's family were tenant migrants, and so they went from place to place. Uh, my father uh, started work in a sawmill at age eight in Henson, Florida. And somehow they met, and they married and came north in 1921, settling in Clareton, Pennsylvania. But before you got even to thinking about college, you were in high school, I understand you were a football star, and that there were some issues that came up with uh, African American women not being allowed to be cheerleaders. And was that your earliest, um, I guess, time involved in activism and in, in trying to change that? Yes, that was uh, the very first uh, active uh, kind of movement to try to restore some rights or actually to achieve some rights for a group of uh, young women in the, in the school system. The football squad was approximately 30 uh, percent uh, non-white and uh, there was an unwritten law that black girls would not be cheerleaders so uh, the squad, the football squad won four games and the week before our most traditional uh, opponents, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, I was able to encourage the black athletes to boycott football practice for a day on Monday. And uh, the coach on Tuesday decided that whatever was needed, it should be changed. Do you remember what year that was? That was 1943. I was uh, 15 years old. Now, education is what brought you to Rochester. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Well, I uh, graduated from Washington and Jefferson College in 1950, and it was interesting those days. Uh, since there were probably four siblings younger than I still uh, at home, I said, well, maybe I'll, I'll get a job. And so I was uh, interviewed by the DuPont Corporation they went through my resume and my activities at Washington and Jefferson College and the interviewer said, well, you have a very dynamic and illustrious career here at Washington and Jefferson College, a star football player, an officer of your class, and uh, a outstanding student. But I just want to remind you that we do not hire blacks in our research facility in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Mm -hmm. So I looked him in the eye and I, I politely said, I, I think that's your problem, not mine. Mm. And so uh, uh, 
I did not get a, uh, a job directly, so I went to Howard University and worked in a master's program in chemistry, and that's where I met my wife, uh, Helen, who also was a graduate student in chemistry. Uh, I had a special course in Washington, D.C. from a person by the name of Dr. Terrell Hill, who had been a professor at the University of Rochester's chemistry department. I took a special course under him in uh, statistical thermodynamics. And uh, I talked to him about, well, where do you think it would be an appropriate institution for me to pursue a doctorate in chemistry? And uh, he highly recommended the University of Rochester. He thought it would be an excellent fit. So uh, I applied and I came to Rochester around August 20th, 1952 to pursue a doctorate in physical chemistry at the University of Rochester and its chemistry department. So it's 1956, now Dr. Walter Cooper of Kodak. What was that like? Well, it was very interesting and I, I worked in a small group called Photographic Theory Laboratory and it had the primary purpose of trying to unravel the, the, the theory of the latent image uh, formation, you know, the very initial steps in uh, chemical photography. My first problem was a tough one. Uh, I worked on the ability of gelatin uh, to accept uh, uh, halogen, which is produced uh, on the exposure of a film. Let's jump forward to 1964. We just noted the 50th anniversary of the racial mm -hmm. unrest here. Now, I know you were out there yourself trying to keep things from getting totally out of hand, but I also understand you have an interesting view of, of what people call the 64 riots, that, that, it, that it was people like you who wanted to make change, who were in the streets as much as, as, much as anyone else. The non-white population underwent an explosion in this community. It was 5,000 in 1945, 7,000 in 1950, 17,000 plus in 1957, and in 1960, a tad under 24,000. And why was that? Because uh, I would say called truck farming in the area it kind of exploded. Uh, you had farms in Kylerville, uh, Sodoma Farm in Brockport, uh, mm -hmm. farms in Williamson and uh, Sodas, and it needed labor. And the labor was, it was the second surge, I would say, of uh, the influx of blacks from the south in the, into the Rochester area. And how did that change things? It was uh, a difficult process because I'd like to give reference to when other uh, communities or groups came to Rochester in, in waves. For example, when uh, the Jew Jewish community was expanding in the beginning of the 20th century, you had uh, almost immediately formed Bain Street Settlement in 1907. And then when the clothing industry started expanding, uh, in 1912, 1913, you had, uh, they were hiring cutters and tailors from Sicily and Italy. You had the Caltanissetta Society founded in 1913. And in England during World War I, the settlement agency concept uh, started to develop and it was uh, uh, actually implemented here in Rochester with Genesee Settlement Agency, uh, Lewis Street and so forth to take care of immigrant streams coming to the community. No such instrument, community instrument, was uh, developed or institutionalized to meet the demands of an incoming uh, population that came from an agricultural economy running headlong into a rather sophisticated industrial economy. And I see, I see that as one of the basic problems that has vexed this community with the expansion of people who are looking for opportunity. But an educational institution 
that did not at least prepare the parents that their children had to compete in a in highly sophisticated industrial community. And now we're faced with the very vexatious problem of how do you prepare a generation coming whose parents come from an agricultural economy to be participants in a digital economy which is emerging. Well, you're very involved in efforts to try to change things in education. There's a school named after you, school number 10, the Dr. Walter Cooper Academy, and I know you're very committed to it. So what, what do you see as uh, perhaps a, a way to start to bridge that gap? What I see, I think, is some fundamental differences in the, the population which is impoverished compared to the one of the Depression years. There are some fundamental differences. I grew up during the Depression years, and, but you had family. Uh, at the time of uh, the Depression years, over 80% of black children lived in a household with two adults. That persisted until the Moynihan Report came out in 1965, which showed that at that time, you still had over 70% of uh, black children living in a household with two adults. Uh, but from 1965 until the present 2010 census, there was a, almost an exponential decline in what you would call children living in, in a household with two adults. In the African American population, it's only 30%. So if you're caught in a situation where there's been a serious erosion of the family. What, what is an adequate substitute in terms of education to meet the hopes and aspirations of a new generation of children? And I, my feeling is the school becomes the refuge for the children. Others have talked about residential schools and so forth, but it's still the family. You're a former member of the New York State Board of Regents. Uh, do you think that as, as a, a government, we've been focusing on some of the wrong issues? Uh, I mean, one of the big debates right now is about Common Core, but you don't mention Common Core or teaching. You're talking about the family and about support for uh, the students. While I was a voting regent from 1988 until 19. 98 and I, I, as an emeritus, I still serve on two regents committees. I, uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, uh, the Common Core uh, may have uh, emerged out of uh, the experience of New York State regents, for example, uh, going to sending groups to Europe. Uh, in, in, the, in 1989 and 1992, for example, I, w I visited the German system twice uh, those years, and uh, you saw the high quality, especially of their apprenticeship programs. And uh, we asked ourselves the questions, uh, why would a, uh, uh, a country whose economic base was destroyed during World War II and within a period of uh, less than 50 years emerges the strongest uh, uh, economy in Western Europe. And one has to look, take a look at the educational system and you come up with the answer. A system that uh, has some tracking in it but has mobility in it and has probably the world's best apprenticeship programs. And so in the early 1992, uh, uh, we attempted, we had $10 million from the National Science Foundation uh, to institute or revolutionize the teaching of math, science, technology in our uh, uh, K through 8, a STEM program. Uh, Rochester had three schools, Buffalo One. What, what year was this? This was 1992. 1992, and we're still talking about yeah. STEM because it was never really implemented. I'll give you an example. Rochester had three schools. New York City only had four. We had schools 39, 43, and 55. Uh, we had uh, very uh, excellent 
staff development programs at Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute during the summers. 55 never participated. They were kicked out of the program in, at midpoint of the five-year program. Uh, 43 with a black principal was only lukewarmly involved and they left on their own initiative. Only one at Rochester School stayed in the program. That was 39 with a Cecilia Golden as principal and the lead te uh, teacher, Ben Lynn Gatto, who now runs the, uh, 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 the uh, Horizon program at the University of Rochester. But Lynn Gatto was the state teacher of the year in 1999 and the national teacher of the year in 2005. That school did an excellent job of participating in a STEM program, 1992 to 1997. Well, not every school can have the teacher or principal of, of the year or <clears throat> of the country. So what happens with, with the other schools? Why, why did they drop out or get kicked out of this program? Well, my, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, you're not, uh, there was a rejection of having an external program, external source, supposedly dictating to you what the children needed. Mm. And they themselves had not taken a careful assessment of what children needed to be highly competitive in a global economy. Uh, the region saw it, but uh, we did not get the cooperation. Another thing, we talk about charter schools today. In 1994, uh, the regents recognized the, the pressure for charter schools, so there was the uh, concept of 21st century schools. And what were the 21st century schools? Each school, school district, and we must have had 720 school districts in the state at that time, could, could choose schools to be designated as 21st century schools. Uh, their performance would be reported directly to the Commissioner of Education, bypassing what we, what critics call local mandates and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, the first year of the program, and I chaired the committee, we had 30 applicants, we chose 10. The second year, we only had 10. They boycotted the 21st century concept. I, I see a, a distinct difference between uh, the uh, community of the 60s in terms of leadership. In the, in the 60s, maybe it was uh, catalyzed by the fact we had a national civil rights organization and movement going on, and the community was certainly energized by the visits of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, uh, A. Philip Randolph, Thurgood Marshall, and others. Now, you knew some of these people. Well, yes, I met them. I knew Malcolm X very, very well. How, how, did, how did he influence you? Well, the Malcolm X influenced me to the extent that here was a man with a brilliant brain. He was highly educated. And I often <clears throat> thought that if he had been born under and reared under different circumstances, he would have been our quantum physicist. Mm. So it just highlighted to me the necessity to train people well in terms of education. See, the appearance of Malcolm X in this community was initiated by the fact that in November of 1900 and, uh, 1962, out of about 1,330 prisoners, there were about 770 blacks, 17 of whom were black nationalists. <clears throat> and they had the temerity to request a uh, a, a, to have a Muslim minister come in one day a week to provide services. The warden turned it down, so they went on a hunger strike, and that brought Malcolm X to the community in November of 1962. In February 1964, when we had a meeting at Bain Street on police brutality, we had 800 in attendance. He gave a fiery speech, but he he, his last comment was now, go home in peace, don't tear up your own communities. That was in February 1964. The last time I saw him was February 15, 1965. 
he was assassinated six days later. I met Martin Luther King Jr. in uh, February, I believe, 1958, when he visited Colgate Rochester Divinity School. So you had those kinds of meetings taking place, and the community was not isolated from national leadership that was doing significant things. A. Philip Randolph came here, <coughs> and uh, uh, Abernathy, and so the community was uh, really apprised of what was happening from a national scene. What about Thurgood Marshall? Thurgood Mar Marshall was a very large, heavy voice, dynamic person, and he believed in uh, analogies of, uh, of, of his involvement in civil rights, and uh, uh, I'll never forget at the reception, or maybe during his presentation here, he said, uh, uh, people said, be patient, wait for time. He said, well, if you're asking me to wait for breakfast, I'm willing to do that. And, and if dinner is late, I'm willing to wait. But if a man has his, his hands around my throat choking me to death, don't ask me to be patient. Now, you have two children who have followed you in education. Yes. Uh, they're both um, at Hobart in William Smith College. Well, my, uh, my youngest son, who uh, has a doctorate out of uh, Harvard in economics, and his wife uh, are on the faculty at Hobart and William Smith. And my son is just retired and he uh, he's writing books in fact he and his brother his are writing books a book about my life I know we're, we're running out of time so I want to ask you the same three questions I ask all my guests okay. starting with if there's one thing you could change about this community what would it be I think that uh, people have to understand some of the historical context of, uh, of the emergence of the various immigrant groups and racial groups in this community. And I think they have to have a better understanding of uh, how uh, some groups have, uh, have become disadvantaged because of changes in, in our economy. For example, I, I see clearly the problem of inequality because my father worked as a laborer for 44 years, but as a laborer, he made enough money to provide shelter and, 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 uh, and, a, and actually maintenance for a family of seven children. A person as a laborer today cannot do that. So that was uh, a glue that kept families together. And I think instead of blaming everything on poverty, let's, let's Let's look in a historical context how people have been impoverished and what mechanisms and what they use to get out of impoverishment. For example, I don't see any way out except through education uh, as the defining uh, role for transforming the life of a family. My family was transformed by education and you know, I had, out of the seven, five went on to college, uh, three earned advanced degrees in, in my family. And we came from nothing. I kid students at school that when I grew up, we lived on three square meals a day, oatmeal, cornmeal, meal, and miso meal. But, but, <laughs> but I, I think you, I still believe that there are family v values and institutional values that persisted in the 60s and uh, 50s and depression years that enable families to survive and to encourage their children to go on to college. See, what bothers me is, for example, I, I look at the black church. After the Civil War, it was primarily the Quakers and institutions funded by the Rosenwald Fund and that provided monies in, in historical black churches that provided the money and time to try to bring literacy to basically illiterate free slaves. And so it was the same national black church bodies working with the Freedmen's Bureau and the Morial Act
that were the principal founder, founders of the historical black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. So they, there's this heritage. But if you look for a memory of it in terms of the activity of churches, you don't see it, particularly in the area of education. Well, Dr. Cooper, despite all these um, challenges, you made Rochester your home, you raised your family here. What do you love about Rochester? Oh, there, I think I've had, uh, I've had wonderful relationships with people. I've uh, enjoyed that. Uh, many of the institutions I've had wonderful relationships with. I love the, uh, the scenery, the park systems, uh, and uh, the overall, I can tolerate the weather even in the winter time, but uh, I think it has uh, the fundamental elements to be, once again, to be an outstanding uh, community. Uh, it has a rich history, which we should know more about, and often I will quote Frederick Douglass, in particular in terms of educating young children. Frederick Douglass once said, it's easier to create strong children than to try to repair broken men. So I have a strong belief that if we do the job right in pre-K to six with the help and cooperation of parents or families that it, no matter what the structure is, that we can see a new generation of educated young people who will make their, who will make their points in this community and in this world. And finally, what do you think is Rochester's best kept secret? I would say that the, one of the best kept secrets is the high quality of your, your medical institutions here. And uh, the effort that uh, many of our institutions of higher learnings are are, are, are doing to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Well, I'll be waiting for that book about Dr. <laughs> Walter Cooper to come out, so put aside one of those first uh, editions for me. Okay, I will do that, Norman. Thanks for having me on this program. Dr. Cooper, thanks for being my guest. Thank you. And thank you for watching. You can share this program or watch it online at wxxi.org. And we'll see you next time on Norman Company.